This is the Real Estate Investing 365 Podcast, your go-to source for real estate investing strategies so you can start living the life you want and get where you want to go with your host, Justin Hanna. What's up, everybody? Welcome back. Another episode of Real Estate Investing 365. Today, I got with me Henry Washington. He's in the Arkansas market, and he's built a nice portfolio of 40 plus, maybe more now at this point, homes uh, while working full time. So what's up, Henry? Thanks for being here. Hey, what's up? Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Man, I'm excited here. I, I heard you recently on the Bigger Pockets podcast. I'm sure a lot of my listeners heard you there and all of a sudden you got, I heard you got to go on to uh, Fox Business. There was a Business Insider article, all kinds yeah. of stuff. Yeah, it went kind of crazy after that. That's cool, man. That's that's awesome. So uh, why don't we give everybody a little bit of background, like where you come from, uh, where you're located, and then how you kind of got interested in real estate first before we dive into all your all your properties. Sure, man. Absolutely. I uh, was uh, born and raised in California. Um, uh, came from a uh, um, family of educators. So my, my father and stepmother are teachers, and then my mother was a uh had a waste management out in uh in Cal in Kern County, California. So uh, you know, education was always important in my household. So uh left home to go to school and got my degree in Virginia. And I was there for a few years working for the military and then I moved to Arkansas to uh found a job opportunity out here and just moved here on a whim. And so I'm living in Arkansas, investing in Arkansas. Uh as far as, you know, how investing came about, man, I, uh, you know, I, I had never really thought about, you know, real estate as a source of income prior to, to getting married and then got married and realized that I, I didn't have money. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I started to, uh, you know, literally freaked out one night and started to figure, tried to figure out how I could, you know, create passive income streams or secondary income streams. Really at that point, I was looking for any additional income. <laughs> um, uh, but through my research kind of landed on lots of articles and stories about people who have or and are investing in real estate. And um, I just saw that as a, a decent option for me. Uh, I never had any fears about being a landlord or, or uh, you know, uh, buying property. So um, I bought two houses at that point, both to live in. So, you know, I, I, from what I knew of the process, I was fine with it. So uh, I just saw it as a, a feasible way to kind of get into the game. So it's in a nutshell, kind of how it all came to pass. Right on. Cool. Kern County, like down in Bakersfield. Is that where you were? That's where I'm from. Yeah. Okay. I've been down to, obviously I'm in California, but I had to work down in Bakersfield uh, for like seven months one time and uh, stayed in a hotel and uh -huh. Man, it was miserable all summer because <laughs> it was 145 degrees. Oh man, it was like you know I work on power lines, um, oh, and then back then it was like you know seven days a week, 14 hour yeah. days trying That's to crazy. do this new line. And gosh, you know we got there early, like in the spring, but by the time the summer came, it was just like miserable all day out there in the heat and sun, climbing poles and towers. I was just like, oh my gosh, what am I doing down here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want no part of that. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Well, that's cool. So then you ended up in Arkansas. Where at in Arkansas are you exactly? Uh, so they call this area Northwest Arkansas. So it's literally in the Northwest corner. It's a, uh, it's kind of a smattering of cities all bunched together. So you've got uh, Bentonville, um, which is where Walmart is headquartered. Um, you've got uh, Rogers which is another large city and then Springdale, which is where Tyson chicken is headquartered. And then in between Springdale and, uh, and uh, Rogers, you have Lowell, which is where JB hunt, the transportation company is headquartered. So, and then just South of all those is Fayetteville where the university of Arkansas is. Um, so you've kind of got these, you know, largish cities all bunched together on top of each other in this, in this corner of Arkansas. But, because there's so much uh big business uh, and industry here you get a you know you get a kind of like a big city feel in a small city kind of a, kind of a, kind of a thing so you've got people from all over the world in this little little corner of arkansas okay cool do you like arkansas better than california uh i i i enjoy living here yeah um uh i enjoy california 
uh, I don't know that I'd ever want to live in Bakersfield again, but I, I wouldn't yeah. put it, I wouldn't put it past me to live in California again. Yeah, for sure. Okay, yeah. cool. So you mentioned something interesting that, um, you know, you realized that once you got married and you start, you were, you're having a family and you're like, man, I don't have enough money to like continue on with this, even though you're working full time. Most people, I would say the majority of people would just think, okay, well, how do I make more money at work? Can I work overtime? Or like, they don't really look outside the box and say, how can I make money on the side? Um, yeah. Do you know why you kind of decided to think that way instead of just thinking, uh, I need to get a better job? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'd say that was a seed that uh, my father planted. Uh, he uh, has always been an entrepreneur. Uh, he's he's always been a high school teacher, but he's he's had side gigs. He uh, before I was born, he told me he would uh, grow plants uh, at the house and then pot them and sell them at the swap meet um, on Sundays. And then he owned an arcade um, at one point. Uh, and then most of my, I'd say for about ten years growing up, he owned a barbecue restaurant. So. Um, I always, I guess, knew in the back of my mind that there were other ways to, to bring in more income besides just your job. And I think the other part of that equation was like, I have a good job. Like I've been getting raises, uh, you know, year over year companies will give you a yearly rate. Like I see what that looks like. And I knew just waiting on that wasn't going to get me there. Yeah, for sure. No, that's definitely, um, I agree with what you're saying because, it's nice to get raises and work overtime, but in the end of the, at the end of the day, you want to have something that's going to like pay you without having to go to work, you know, right. so much yeah. without having to like, like the industry that I'm in that I'm getting out of is the same thing. What, you know, we get raises and I can work all the overtime I want, but sometimes I'm working seven days a week and then I don't see my kids and I don't see my family. So yeah, my paycheck's big, but I don't have time to spend the paycheck. So we got to figure out how to get that side income pass more passively it's not all passive but right. um to where eventually you know maybe we don't have to work you know 60 or 70 hours a week to uh do what we want to do so absolutely that's cool man appreciate that so uh you got started you had bought a couple of your own houses and then you ended up buying what was your first real estate deal that you ended up uh acquiring yeah uh the first deal was a buy and hold so um uh, kind of you know, uh, as the story goes, I, uh, after I figured out, I guess, quote unquote, that I wanted to do real estate, um, the, one of the first things I did was just tell everybody I knew that I was a real estate investor. I hadn't bought anything, but just, uh, I, you know, after I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I had just kind of made a decision that like, this is what it's going to be. Like, this is what's going to change my life. This is what I'm going to be successful at. I remember I had a conversation with my mom early on and I, I don't remember the context of the conversation, but I remember I told her, watch what I turn this into. And um, <laughs> I had no clue what that meant at the time, but I knew, <laughs> I knew that I was going to work as hard as I could to um, make this a successful business for my family. So um, it was kind of just a mindset thing. I, I told myself, you know, that I was going to tell everybody I was an investor. And uh, luckily, you know, that brought me my first deal. Um, buddy of mine uh, had a single family, rented it out, and then needed to sell it to buy something else. So he kind of came to me because he needed to sell it quick and said, hey, heard you buying rental houses. Take a look at this one. So took a look at it the numbers worked and uh i told him i would buy it and then we <laughs> literally googled like real estate contracts in arkansas <laughs> like you know did all the things you probably shouldn't do <laughs> like you should have a lawyer look at that before you just have someone sign a contract but um i just wanted to take action so we signed a contract and uh then i had to figure out how to buy it because i didn't have any money so uh I got on the phone with a buddy of mine who was also an investor. And the, the reason I initially got on the phone with him is because I, I, I couldn't figure out how to come up with the money. And so I was trying to get him to buy it. And uh, he told me, uh, go figure it out, basically, was, was his message. He was like, I could buy it, but you need to figure it out. And so we brainstormed on the phone about options for coming up with the capital for the down payment. And uh, we landed on a 401k loan which 
I didn't know anything about 401k loans at the time. I just thought that if you had ever wanted to touch your 401k money, you had to pay a bunch of taxes. So uh, I did some research. We called my wife's employer. They kind of gave us the information and we were able to take out a 401k loan um, from her, uh, from her 401k for enough for the down payment um, without having to pay the taxes. And then we're paying ourselves back interest on that loan since it's our, you know, it was our money to begin with. And so that's what we used for the down payment. And we bought the house, uh, kept the same guy in it and I raised his rents and it cash flowed from day one. All right, cool. So you had mentioned that, you know, you, for one, the way you got this first deal is that you were just talking to everybody, telling everybody, Hey, I'm a real estate investor, even though you haven't bought anything yet, but your mindset was like, listen, I'm going to be a real estate investor. Right. Let me just talk about it. And then hopefully something will come. And that's what happened. You, somebody, your friend brought you this deal, but you had mentioned that the numbers worked on it. So you wanted to buy it. Right. Do you remember what the numbers were like your criteria sure. for that first property? Yeah. 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 Uh, I paid one fifteen um, at the time uh realtor told me it was worth about 140 to 150 um the tenant that was in it was paying about 900 a month um to live there and uh since i was the the plan was just to keep him there and raise his rent so there was no rehab so we uh we paid 115 20 or 15% down on a 20 year note and I think it was around five and a half percent interest. Uh, and then we raised his rent to 1100 and, uh, that gave us enough to cover the note and the expenses and cash flow a little bit. You know, it wasn't a home run deal as far as cash flow is concerned, but it was a deal that like started the ball rolling because it showed me that a, it was possible B you could do it without money. Like, said differently you need money to invest in real estate it just doesn't always have to be your money yeah um um and that uh you know we were now getting a return in our investment immediately so that kind of just made me hungry to want to figure out how to do more deals yeah no for sure well and the thing is too is what's interesting and good for somebody that hasn't bought their first property yet. You know, if you go the conventional financing route and you're going to buy your first investment property, you know, you're going to need you know, 20% down for single family or 25% down for yeah. uh, two family or to four family. And then you can get a 30 year loan. But what you, what you just mentioned was that you put 15% down and you got a 20 year loan. So that must mean that you went with a local bank. Correct. Okay. Which is, yep. Perfect to, to let people know, you know what I mean? Like if you go to a normal, normal conventional loan route to a mortgage broker, they're going to have all this criteria that you need all this money. You're going to, you're going to need experience and all that, whatever you're going to need to buy that first property. And you're like, well, I don't really have that. I don't really have the, quite the money. I don't know how to do this, but you figured out to get money from your 401k. How did you know to go check with local banks to end up getting the loan? Um, a combination of things. Yeah. So, you know, to touch on a little bit what you're saying, right. So yeah, I get a lot of questions from people about these small regional banks and, and, and what you're saying is spot on, right. So if you go to a larger bank or, you know, the chases, the Quicken loans and those kinds of things, Bank of, bank of America, and, and you're looking for a 30 year note, they're evaluating you in your credit, credit worthiness. And that what they determine about you is essentially what's going to get you approved or not approved for the loan. Whereas these smaller, more, uh, uh, local regional banks that are doing these, uh, you know, portfolio loans or construction loans, they're evaluating you too, but not nearly as stringent. They're, they're also evaluating the quality of the deal, right? They want to know what kind of return on investment this deal is going to provide. And so, um, uh, you you know you don't have to provide as much documentation. I think I think it would have required uh, two years of tax returns and then your LLC docs and uh, you know I think it was F two uh, check stubs. I mean that was really all the documentation that was needed because they also uh, on me anyways they also wanted to know like what I was buying it for, what I was going to rent it for, what I was going to renovate it for. So they evaluate the deal as well. Um, 
I, I, I went that route because when I, I don't know, for some reason, when I started my LLC, I wanted to uh, get a business bank account and I didn't want to bank at the same bank where our personal money is at just because, you know, commingling is harder if you do it that way. And then my wife also works for that bank that we bank at. So I was trying to just make sure we keep everything separate. And the first bank that we went to was a bank where a friend of hers worked, which happened to be kind of the small regional bank. So I kind of had somebody there that knew kind of the ins and outs of these, these, these smaller banks. And so that kind of helped. And then I met with one of the VPs at that bank prior to opening the account. And then I was also part of the real estate investors association here and they would always have banks like come to some of the events to talk to people. So there was like resources around me that kind of guided me to that direction. I didn't, I didn't really know it on the front side. So, you know, I would tell people um, if there's real estate meetups in your area, like go to them, you know, it doesn't matter if the, you know, content or the speakers aren't something you're interested in, right? These meetups are more about who you can meet and the relationships you can build because, you know, I, I, I was, I had people around me pointing me in the right direction and I didn't even know it. Yeah, for sure. Why did you, you mentioned that you started an LLC. Why did you go that route instead of just putting it in, in your own name to start? Uh, research. So uh, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad when I first got started and that led me to his other books. And he had a book on um, uh, just kind of legal entities. And so I read that just to understand what kind of entities were out there from a protection standpoint. I, I knew everybody does an LLC, but I didn't know why. And so I read that book to kind of give me the baseline of knowing, should I use an LLC? And if so, why? So that, that that's what led me there. Okay. Yeah. I mean, and it's good to do sometimes it's bad to do. Uh, I mean, not bad, but might not be the best thing to do other times. I know right. um, one of the reasons I haven't had a LLC for my properties, I put all my properties in a trust. Mm -hmm. That's because I'm in California and in California, there's like a f franchise tax fee or whatever. It's just it's yeah. 800 bucks a year, no matter what. And I'm yeah. thinking, well, why don't I wait till I move to Idaho to open my LLC to put yeah. properties in? Because I'm not going to pay an additional $800 a year for each LLC that I end up opening up. It just doesn't make sense. Um, but legally it probably has some protection that um, I don't have currently. So, there's pluses and minuses. So that's Absolutely. good to know. Um, so did you end up using a property manager for this property or do you manage all your properties yourself? No, I manage everything myself. Um, <laughs> when I got started, like when I bought that first property, like I knew, like I said, I was going to try to do everything I could to be successful, but my plan wasn't to grow at the, at the rate that we've grown. Right. My plan was to buy one, see how it goes. If it goes well look into buying another one, um, maybe doing a flip. Like my plan was, I think I, I looked through my old goal, old not that long ago. And I think the plan was to do three to five deals that year, which are, yeah, in a year, it, which was pretty aggressive. I thought at the time, uh -huh. but we blew through that in a month. <laughs> like, <laughs> so, so it just, uh, it just went a lot faster. Uh, and I, I loved it so much more than I thought I would. So, okay, well, let's dive into that. So how did it grow so quickly? So you buy this first property, which again, it's like you weren't prepared. I mean, you were prepared for it. You knew the knowledge, but you never done it before. You didn't have a ton of money. You didn't really know how to do it, but you just took action and started networking and talking to people, asking questions. Right. So you ended up buying that first property. Then all of a sudden it just accelerated. Yeah, so, yeah, so, uh, you know, once you, once you get that first deal under your belt, man, it's, it's so motivating. Like I, I had no expectation that it would be that motivating. Um, but, um, when somebody, you know, you get a, you get money showing up in your bank account every month and you have to do much. Like I was like, how do I do that again right now? And so we started, um, marketing, um, for deals at the time. And, uh, Right away for your second property, you started marketing? Yeah, well, yeah. So I started marketing, like, literally right after we bought that house. And then at the same time, I had an agent bring me another deal that I ended up flipping. So I was doing a flip and marketing kind of at the same time. Um, and then I also 
did a refi on the equity of that first property. Um, sorry, not a refi. Um, uh, HELOC. HELOC. HELOC, yeah. I did a HELOC on that property. So I was able to access some of the equity from that property. I did a flip that provided some capital. And then I started marketing. So I had access to more funds at the same time I was marketing. And so as the leads started to come in, I was able to do something with them. Um, so it just kind of all worked out. The timing of everything kind of worked out. Yeah, for sure. So the, I guess the, the, the key part of that first deal is that you happen to get that deal at a good price. So everybody says, obviously, you, you know, you make your deals when you buy them. So that's kind of what happened with you. Uh, do you know, do you have any insight to why your friend wanted to sell this just directly to you without selling it on the market and maybe getting more money? Yeah. Yeah. Um, he is just a, a great friend of mine and, uh, you know, I think he, he genuinely wanted to help me get started. Um, and so I think that that was some motivation for him. Like there was no, you know, I was upfront and honest with him about everything. You know, I said, you know, if you sell this with a realtor, you're going to make more money, but he, he didn't want to. And there was some motivation on his part too. Right. So he was trying to buy a property from somebody else that he knew and he needed to, the, the loan product he needed to use required him to have sold this other one before he bought that house. So, uh, and there was the time was, the clock was running out on him buying that house. So mm -hmm. had, there was some time issues. And then, uh, uh, the tenant that was living there, he wasn't taking care of the property. Like, for him to sell it, he would have had to put this guy out and then spend a lot of time and money getting this place turned around and presentable in order for a realtor to sell it. So it would have taken him, you know, you got to give somebody 30 days notice, right? So there's 30 days there. Hopefully if he gets out in 30 days, then you got to do some renovations and he's the kind of guy who's going to do it himself. So he's going to spend some time weekends there doing that. Right. And so, when it's all said and done, it would have been months before he was able to actually put it on the market and realize that return. So selling to me provided him a way to get, get it over with quickly. Yeah, for sure. And that's a ex excellent point is that we don't really know exactly what people's motivations are, you know, when, whether we're sending out direct mail or we're just telling people that we're into real estate investing. I mean, for example, right now we're putting our house on the market. Well, you know, we're going to list it at one price, but I, I would take, if somebody was to call me, I would probably take 50 grand less than the listing <laughs> price right now, because it's like, it would be so much easier. I don't got to deal with the headache and inspections and all the people walking through the house and keeping my kids, keep it all clean. It's like, I would just rather move on, but you know, sure. whatever. So how, many, how many bedrooms, how many bathrooms? <laughs> Five beds, three <laughs> baths. <laughs> we're just listing uh, what? Six seventy nine. So yeah, you want to come out here, you want a little what a different market. <laughs> yeah. You know what I can get for six seventy nine here? Probably a mansion. I mean, right. gosh, something a hundred right. acres. <laughs> right. <laughs> I know. Well, it's California, you know what I mean? Yeah, um, doesn't doesn't mean mean I'm profiting that much, but that's just gonna be a selling price. <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh yeah, no, that's definitely a it just drives home the point that that first deal is so important, not only mentally, but to make sure you get a good deal on the property. Mm -hmm. That way you were able to like you, you were able to get a HELOC use that money for your, for more properties. You also did a flip. Um, so your next buy and hold, you ended up getting from an agent, but at the same time you were direct mail marketing. Is that the kind of marketing you were doing? Correct. Yeah. We started sending postcards um, pretty much immediately after we sold that or after we bought that house. And the, like my, my logic for sending postcards was because they were cheaper. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I had researched for a while prior to marketing and then this deal kind of popped up. And so I kind of put the marketing on the back burner until I figured out how to buy this deal. And so when the time came back up to start marketing, I, I kind of just got into this analysis paralysis, right? Should I do letters? Should I do postcards? Should I use a company to outsource it all? Right. Where do I get my leads from? And, uh, I think, uh, at one point I just said, all right, I'm just going to do something. And, you know, whatever I do, if something doesn't work, then I'll tweak it along the way. So I just kind of had to stop thinking through every detail and just do something. So again, I didn't have 
uh, access to a bunch of money. So I actually took out a no interest credit card. Um, it was like 15 months, no interest. And um, uh, the research I had done, I wanted to send a thousand postcards. And based on the math of buying the list and then what it costs to mail the postcards, I was going to have to spend about $1,500. So, um, you know, what I kind of learned through that process was like, I hadn't done anything and I just kept researching. And the reason I was doing that was because I was scared. And when I figured out like, well, what is it I'm truly scared of? Right. And for me, I was scared of losing money. Like that was the fear I had. I yeah. didn't have money to lose. And so if I put up, you know, if I scrounge up some money and then do a marketing campaign and it yields no results, right. That's, you know, $1,500 when you don't have $1,500 hurts. So, mm -hmm. Um, you know, kind of what I did and, and what I tell people to do is, you know, I just kind of wrote down, what is it that I was worried about? And I was worried about losing money. And then, so then I said, okay, well, well, how much money are you worried about losing? And that's when I did the math to figure out it was going to cost me $100 to send the mail. And so I said, I was worried about losing $1,500. I said, so how can you, how do you resolve that problem? Right. And that's where we landed on the credit card. And so basically what that meant was. If I put $1,500 on this credit card and I got 15 months to pay it off, uh, you know, divide that, you know, and you get $100 a month. And so I looked at my finances and said, can I afford $100 a month payments for 15 months if I fall on my face? And the answer to the question was yes. And so once I got there, like I wasn't scared anymore. Like I, there was no fear any longer. And so we just started marketing and, uh, uh, we sent a thousand postcards. I sent them all at once. I don't recommend that if you have a day job because um, the phone rang a lot and there was a lot of people yelling at me and asking questions. <laughs> and <laughs> How did you get my information? And, 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 uh, uh, but you know, I've, it, <laughs> I remember the first time the phone rang, I freaked out. Like I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know what to do. I yeah. didn't know what to ask. And so I got on that first phone call and I don't even, I think the first phone call was a, no, the first phone call I got yelled at. I definitely got yelled at, but I didn't, I remember like, you don't like, I hadn't thought through these things until it happened. The phone rang and I freak out and I answer yeah. it and I'm like, hello, like that's <laughs> yeah. the best way to answer the phone. And I didn't know what to ask the man. So I wanted to make sure I didn't do that again. So I immediately Googled like, uh, scripts for, um, motivated sellers and mm -hmm. just found one and printed it out and kept it with me so that the next time the phone rang, I could at least like have something prompting me to ans ask questions. I didn't even know why I was asking the questions on the list. I just need <laughs> needed to keep the conversation going. Yeah, that's so funny. I relate exactly to what you're saying there. The first time I mailed letters and like, I remember when the phone started ringing, I came, I came home to my wife. I was like, honey, listen, I got five phone calls today or whatever it was. You know what I mean? I was so excited, but the same thing happened that people called and like, I didn't know what to say. I was like, hello. <laughs> oh, you're really calling me? This is weird. This is crazy. And then I, then I had a lady, I've told, I said this before, but you know, the worst one I had get on, gets on the phone and she sounds like an old, older lady, you know, probably in her seventies or eighties. And at first I was like, all right, I'll be real nice. And dude, like two seconds in, she started laying into me how you got a California phone number and I hate Californians and I'd rather burn my damn house to the ground and sell it to you and lose all my money, then help you out. And just going off on me of all of this stuff. I was like, Oh man, I don't know if I'm ready for this. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I relate to, I understand what you're saying um, for yeah. sure. But can you explain what criteria? So if somebody wants to do this, right, somebody's out there and like, okay, I want to start mailing, do mailers and I can do the same thing. I can afford 1500 bucks. What service did you use, first of all, and then what criteria did you use to mail to? Sure. Um, at that time, we used one of the credit bureaus. It was either Experian or Equifax to pull our list. Um, and we did that because they were cheaper than everything else we were looking at um, huh. um, per lead and so or per name. So um, we used them to pull the list. And then, um, and so what I, what I, as far as criteria, what I looked for at the time um, was 
really just around equity, you know, because you need equity and you need motivation to have a deal. Without those, you got, you know, they don't need, they need a realtor, not you. Mm-hmm. So, um, so for motivation, I used age, um, just banking on the fact that people over a certain age probably have deferred maintenance and equity. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, hoped for the best. <laughs> um, so, uh, that was really the criteria we used. And then I, I used, um, so I have a local like print shop. They print, you know, print shops do t-shirts and all that kind of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. it, literally because, uh, one of the people that sat next to me at work, her mom owned a print shop. And as I was kind of like trying to figure out how to go about mailing, I just, it, it dawned on me that they might send mail. So I literally just tapped her on the shoulder and said, Hey, does your mom send mail? And she was like, I don't know. I think so. Call her. And so <laughs> she gave me her mom's phone number and I called her and I told her what I was trying to do. And she was like, yeah, we'll do that for you. And so I, I pulled my list and literally just emailed her a list and said, can you mail some postcards for me? And she was said, sure. What do you want it to say? And I was like, I don't know. So, so I Googled, you know, Mark, uh, you know, uh, postcards for, you know, real estate investors and picked one that I thought looked good and said, I want it to say this and sent it to her. And she sent me a proof like an hour later and was like, is this good enough? And I was like, yeah, great. And then she sent mail that day or the next day. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I like your style that it's kind of like, uh, yep, screw it. Just do it. You right, know, hurry up. Just, it. just, it's better to make it happen. And I remember Grant Cardone saying that I think is like when he wrote his first book or whatever, after he published it, he realized that like half, you know, there's hundreds of misspellings and grammatical errors. And he's like, but I don't really care because at least I got the information out there and I got it done, you know, as books going forward, he won't make that same mistake. And you going forward, you won't make the same mistakes, but right. it's a million times better than not doing anything. Right. Absolutely. Cool. Absolutely. So, I didn't even know you could go to the credit bureaus and pull lists. That's yeah, uh, I think, I think my wife found that I didn't know either, but, uh, I think when we were just trying to research where to, where to buy lists, cause we toyed around with the idea of like going to the assessor's office and trying to figure out how to get our own list for free. And then realized quickly that the juice isn't worth the squeeze as far as, you know, what it costs to, mm-hmm. to just have somebody compile it all for you. Um, and so I think she did some Google in there and found that. So I can't, I can't take credit for that one. Okay, cool. She right also, on. She also found, she also found, I think our, our third deal on Facebook. She was like oh, yeah. Facebook snooping, <laughs> um, uh, and saw some story of, about a guy who, uh, grandkids were living in a house and, I think the the post was by the grandmother and she was just sad about how they torn the house up. I don't know if there's pictures or not pictures, but she was just like, I don't know what to do. We need to get rid of this. Like they're just tearing our house up. And I think she messaged her and said, would you consider selling it? And when she said, yes, she like sent me the lady's information. And I like showed up later that day. It might've been later that day or the next day. And I showed up with a contract in my hand huh. and put the house under contract. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, so well, I got a quick question on that. When you show up to a house like that, do you do research ahead of time with like what you think the house is going to be worth? Absolutely. I do. So I do all my research ahead of time and now I'm a whole lot quicker at it because I know my market and my areas. And so I can pretty quickly know based on talking to the seller, if it's going to be something that I need to make an offer on when I get there or if I need to do a little more research. But at, with that particular house, it was a three bed, two bath on three acres in the middle of town. And so, and I think, I think my wife had, yeah, I think she had already talked to the lady and the lady said that they just needed to get it paid off and um, that they owed 90. And so I just figured that that was good. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, for my market, I, you know, I figured it was probably worth, I figured the house repaired, um, was probably worth somewhere in the neighborhood of two twenty five, Um, and I had, a, I had a, my buddy of mine that was a realtor, um, running comps for me, but I knew it was a good enough deal that I needed to go look at it. So, and if she wanted 90, I would, and that's what she had to have anyway. That's what she owed. And I, you know, I did, it wasn't like I needed to figure out how to get lower than that. 
Yeah, for sure. Okay, cool. So you start, you start doing all these direct mail marketing, you send out a thousand postcards. Do you remember how many calls you get off that first mailing? Oh, uh, probably not exact. (laughs) I got a lot, man. Yeah. I would say that I'd say I probably got 50 phone calls. Wow. Um, um, which is a lot when Mm -hmm. you have a day job. And, uh, and so I quickly learned my partner was like, man, you need to break that up. So we started sending 250 a week instead of just a thousand all at once to kind of space out that volume. And, you know, cause I tell people all the time, like you should take action, like send some mail, but only spend the money and send the mail. If you're going to do the work when the leads come in, mm-hmm. right? Because if you're going to freak out when the leads come in and you're not going to call people back and you're not going to go see houses like quickly and you're not going to make offers right then you're wasting money and you're wasting time like working these leads is it's it's time consuming you know um uh especially when they're all at once when you when you spread them out it's not so bad but um but yeah so we would uh you know we we sent them and then gosh 50 phone calls probably looked at 10 houses and got three deals Okay, cool. Yeah, no, that's, that's a uh, good advice right there. Cause I definitely did that before is, you know, I just sent them out and then I wasn't necessarily ready to start acting on them. You know what I mean? So then most of the um, money that got spent got just got wasted. So definitely the speed is the key. Cause a lot of times you'll catch somebody that needs to sell it right now. And if you don't like follow up with them quickly or go out there and make an offer on the house, you know, if a week goes by, they might be like, Oh, I changed my mind or, Oh, somebody else has got it or you're just going to lose that deal. So Speed is definitely the key. I mean, I tell people it's a timing game, right? With marketing, like what you're trying to do is you're trying to get your piece of mail in that person's hand in the exact time when they have thought about and are ready to sell their house at a discount. Like it's timing. Yeah. Like, so that's why consistency in mailing is important because they may not even have thought about like, getting out from underneath this house they may have just been like "Mm, i'm just gonna deal with it right and then they get your letter and they're like "Mm, i could sell it maybe it's legit maybe it's not right and Mm -hmm. then they get a second letter from you and they're like oh and then they start thinking about it then they start thinking what they could do with the money that they could get if they sell it and then they get excited and then when your letter shows up for the third time they call you right and now they're ready to do a deal and so like you've got that letter in their hand at just the right time so you got to be able to act on it because if you don't you know, like you said, a month later, when they get your fourth letter, they're like over the idea. They don't want to do it anymore. Right? Yeah, no, definitely. So do you guys still use letters or do you still do, you, excuse me, are you doing postcards? No, we, we switched to letters. We were doing postcards and then we switched to letters since uh, we weren't as capital constrained anymore. Um, yeah. Do you find the letters are better than the postcards? The response is better for sure. Okay. And then is it more of a, what type of letter is it? Is it like a yellow letter or kind of like mm-hmm. a personal letter with the handwritten signature or something like that? Yeah, no, we do yellow letters. Um, I looked at using one of those, uh, you know, mail services that does all the yellow letters for you. And actually I did, I did a campaign with them. But, uh, one of the benefits to using a, a local print shop is I can quick service somebody's there every time i need to ask a question like i can just send a text message and say hey what's going on with this um so the service wasn't as quick with some of the larger companies um but the smaller companies didn't know what yellow letters were and so i literally just again googled one and we said hey can you match this like and gave her the letter and she went and sourced yellow lined paper and put the same message on them for us okay Cool. So what year, so, um, kind of overview here, what year is that you kind of got started? It was only just a couple of years ago, right? Yeah. 2018, late 2017. Right? <laughs> 2018, late 2017. That just feels like just yesterday. You know what I mean? Right. It just has yeah. gone by so fast. So yeah. in two and a half years, you've gone from nothing, not having any properties to work. How many properties do you have now or units? Uh, 48 with 12 under contract and I'm, that should be closing on the next two weeks. So in two weeks you have 60 units coming up on 60. Yeah. Holy moly. That's crazy. That's awesome. So what was kind of some of the key factors from you moving from just a couple deals to 60 units in two and a half years, you know, like what happened in there and how did financing work? Like what were some of the big things that most people like, I can't even imagine doing that. Yeah. Um, 
marketing is is huge, man. The, the you know, if you talk to any real estate investor, most real estate investors will tell you the two most difficult things about investing are finding good deals and finding good contractors, right? And so it's just like any any business, right? You figure out what the problem is and find a way to solve it. So we built a deal finding business. So we're constantly marketing, you know, whether our plates are full or not, we're marketing, right? Because we want to keep the deal funnel coming in because I know if I can buy a house at a certain price point, then I can make money no matter what I do. There's more exit strategies. Now I know that that's semi unique to my market because, you know, for me with the price point of houses here, like, if I can't sell it as a flip, I can rent it out and make money. Whereas at $675,000, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to rent, and, 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 you know, as an exit strategy. But so, but I know if I can buy at 70% of market value minus repairs, like I can make money. I can flip it. I can stick a renter in it. I can close on it and just do nothing and call another investor and have them buy it, for, buy it from us. Like, um, so, um, I don't have to worry too much about my plate being full. Um, as long as the deals are coming in, I'll just sell those deals. Right. Okay. So we know how you're getting all the deals. You're getting it cause you built a good marketing company. Um, a quick question on that. Do you use a CRM to track all this stuff or anything? Or is it just, I wish I did. Yeah. I <laughs> um, no, I haven't. I, I need to. They're they're so expensive. <laughs> yeah. And uh I don't um for, for how I manage my leads, like I don't need all the bells and whistles. I just kind of need a place where I can, you know, track the basic the basic things about a property. And so uh we're actually looking at developing our own, just kind of, you know easy, easy peasy, easy to use CRM for strictly for real estate investors. So we're working on that right now. Okay. Um, well, how are you guys funding all these deals? So did you get a line of credit with local banks or what happened? Are you just happen to be like super rich now because you have 60 units coming down, down the pipeline? <laughs> yeah, absolutely not, man. Um, uh, yeah. So it's all been construction and portfolio loans and because we buy so cheap, um, you know, the, the cash flow has been able to sustain us, um, uh, as far as making sure those loans get paid off, uh, each month. And, uh, we do six to 10 flips a year and those flips help us have the capital to buy more rentals. So it's just been, just been a churn and burn, man. We, uh, you know, it, each deal for us is situational. So if I get something under contract, I may, uh, you know, if I've got the capital, then, and it works, we'll keep it as a rental. And if uh, I don't have the capital, then we sell it. And, you know, you just don't get married to any, any particular deal. It's just, what does, what does my situation call for at the moment? And then make that decision. There's been times, like, I can look back and think, man, we sold that deal. I should have kept it. It would have been nice. Yeah, it would have, but it didn't fit. Like, at the moment, I, I couldn't have done that, right? It's just not what my capital situation was, was, was able to withstand at the time. So we right. just keep the marketing coming. And if you keep the marketing coming, you, you, you know, you make a decision. And if, you know, if you're cash flush, then you keep it. And if you're not, then you sell it. Okay. So let, I just, before we move on to kind of transitioning out here towards our next little spot, but I, I kind of want to walk through um, a scenario of a deal. So you guys are marketing, you send a letter to somebody, it's been a couple of times, they end up calling you and they say, Hey, you know, I'm kind of interested in selling my property. They, you say, okay, well, do you decide on every property that somebody calls and says they're interested in to go look at it? Or is there some criteria that you ask, ask them first? I'm sure there is, right? Yeah, there is. So I would say this, like from, you know, advice, if you're new, go see everything, right? even if you don't think you're going to buy it, it's not a waste of your time. Like mm -hmm. every house you go see, you're learning something. You're learning about your market. You're learning about what motivation sellers have. You're learning about what it takes to rehab a property, right? You're learning 
just there's tons of information that you're that you're gaining and gathering when you're going and looking at properties and talking to sellers. Also, you don't know what you don't know. Like it may not sound like a deal, but they may not have told you everything, right? Mm -hmm. So when you get there, you might learn something that makes this a deal. Um, so my theory on on real estate is everything's a deal until it's not, right? And sure, now that I'm more seasoned, right, I'll evaluate more on the phone and determine whether it's worth the effort to go look at it. Yeah. Because, you know, I've been down in the trenches and looked at a bunch of stuff I shouldn't have looked at, right, but learned along the way. Um, so, yeah, do we ask qualifying questions uh, up front. Um, <laughs> the most important one is how much do you want for it? <laughs> um, I ask everybody that. People sometimes don't or they're scared to ask people that. Most people will tell you. <laughs> like, yeah. Most people will tell you kind of what they want, or at least a ballpark of what they want, right? And then I can use that as a gauge um, uh, to know if it's something I need to go see. Because if they're wanting retail or close to retail, then I can have that conversation with them up front to say, hey, if you want retail, I, I want you to get that. I can't provide you with that. But if you're willing to go through the route with a realtor, I think that you can absolutely get there. And then if they still say, well, what could you give me? Come look at it. Then I know there's some other motivation there. There's something else they're not telling me because I just told you, you can probably make like 50 grand more. <laughs> and you just said, well, you come look at it anyway. So now I know we're on the same playing field. We're in the same ballpark. Right. Um, yeah. Even though they haven't told me what the number is. Um, yeah. Well, that's one thing that I like, I come across a lot right now. Um, we're I'm marketing up in Idaho mm -hmm. is uh, it seems like it, since it is a hot market, especially there, people, they, a lot of people know it is. So they all want retail. It's like, Oh, you know, I won't take any less than three fifty. And I'm like, well, then you should be talking to a realtor. Don't talk to me because I'm only going to offer you two sixty on the property. You know what I mean? So, um, what do you do in those situations? You just say, Hey, you need to go to a realtor and then you just pass or do you make them an offer anyways? Um, it depends. It depends on where the conversation is going. Right. So, if they're truly just fishing, uh, um, so I have a realtor that sells all our flips. So if they're truly looking for a realtor and they're willing to work with a realtor, then I'll recommend mine. And if they say, well, no, I've already got a realtor, then they were just, you know, they were just fishing in the first place. Yeah. Um, and, um, but you know, some people want retail and they're just in a tough spot and uh, they need to get retail or close to retail. And so I always either try to recommend my realtor or um, point them in a direction of somebody who can help them, right? Just because I can't buy it doesn't mean I can't provide some level of good customer service, right? Because I just want, I want people's experience with me to always be positive, um, A, because that's just good. And, uh, you know, you never know who who's going to, you know, refer you or refer somebody else that's going to get you a deal. And so, just because it doesn't look like it's going to work for me doesn't mean I'm like, okay, bye next one. Right. So I just try to figure out, you know, how can I provide value to you? I have, I've talked to sellers who were in tough situations. They need more than I can offer them. And, uh, I didn't make them an offer, but I, um, referred them to my lawyer, right. To help them sort through whatever legal situation they were going through. And I paid for, you know, their first conversation with my lawyer, um, for their time, just, help them out. Um, I have, uh, I've looked at houses that were hoarder houses and, uh, people were in tough situations and needed more than I can offer. And I've still paid for them, paid professional movers to come move them out when they did sell their house to somebody else to kind of help them get to what they need. Um, so I, I think that there's ways to help people without, um, buying their house and yeah it might cost me some money and not provide me an immediate return but uh it feels good to help people and like i said you never know you know what might come back to you from you being of service to somebody yeah for sure no that's that's super valid points there um so you go out you make let's say you make a pro you make an offer on a property they say yes um you put it under contract now once you put it under contract are you sending every deal to a bank and saying hey will you guys loan on this deal or how does the financing work? Yep. So, uh, if, if, uh, you know, if owner finance is an option, we look at that, you know, anytime somebody has a ton of equity or free and clear, 
we'll ask them about owner financing. And so we'll just kind of talk them through the process and gauge their interest. If they're interested, then we'll talk through an owner finance option. And so then we won't go through a bank. But other than that, yeah, we put it, um, if they call and they're interested, I'll do my research on the front side. I'll show up knowing about what I want to offer. And then based on the repairs, I'll make adjustments to that in my head. And then I'll offer on the spot. And if they agree on the spot, we'll sign the contract. And then from there, I send the contract to my title company and I copy the seller so that they know this is legit. Like the title company is going to take care of it from here on out. They've got your contact info. And then I send it to the bank immediately after that. And I tell the bank kind of what I'm looking for. And I usually put together a quick rehab spec so they know here's what I'm buying it for. Here's what I'm going to do to it. Here's what I'm either going to rent it for or sell it for when it's done. And then they can get back to me in a day or so with their terms. And then if we agree to their terms, then it starts the process on the financing. And we have to usually put anywhere between 10 and 15% down. And then the bank will also cover the construct, you know, the refinance or the rehab loan if that's yeah. what you're doing. 85% of the sale price, 100% of the rehab is oh, financed cool. by the bank. Um, for flips, I bring in private money for that 15% down I have to put in. And so for flips, I pay, only thing out of my pocket is I'm paying closing costs. Everything else is financed either through the bank or through private money. And okay. So on a flip, you'll just bring in not a bank, usually not a bank at all. It'll just be private money for the whole thing. No, no, no. I'll bring in the bank for the 85 and for oh. the hundred percent of the construction. And then I'll bring in a private loan for the 15% down that I need to bring. Okay. Okay, cool. So then, um, so, okay. So you, that's how you get the properties under contract. That's how you end up buying the properties. Um, now once you end up closing the property, let's say you decide to keep it. Are you still self-managing all these units yourself yeah. or yeah? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Oh, um, man. At, at some point, at some point we won't. Um, yeah. uh, but for now it works. Uh, I've kind of, I don't want to say got it down to a science, but I've figured out kind of what takes time and what doesn't take time and then tried to minimize the amount of time, the things that are time consuming take. So um, we do open house showings. So I don't do individual showings. I mean, I will if I'm not getting a ton of traffic, but usually there's not, I mean, vacancy is low here. So if you have an opening, you tend to get a lot of traffic and I pick a time that works for me. I don't really worry about if it works for everybody else. Um, and that's when I show it and uh, usually get a, a tenant pretty quick. My uh, property management software does background checks and uh, credit checks. And so it just kind of spits all that information back out to me and we make a decision and then everything's kind of done online. What property management software do you guys use? Cozy. Huh? Cozy. Oh, cozy. Okay, yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. All right, right on. Well, and that's, that works great right now. It's a good, you know, rental market and everything, but I'm sure yeah. if times change or whatever, you would just adjust your plans and maybe yeah, not, absolutely. maybe not uh, do it the same way, but it's working We're perfect not, now. Not so, yeah. um, uh, okay. So where is Henry headed from now? You got 60 units in two and a half years. Like, are yeah. you going to continue to work full time? Or are you just going to buy as many properties as you can? Like what's your plans going forward? Yeah. Um, uh, man, I, I, this is that question where I wish I had like some eloquent answer, but yeah. I, I don't, it's literally like, I'm going to continue marketing every week consistently. Um, you know, right now, like this is one week I didn't market this week for the first time in, you know, several months just cause things have gotten crazy. Um, but try to continue the consistency in marketing and then kind of let the the deals uh, point me in the direction of, of what we should do. Um, I don't, you know, I was telling somebody this the other day, like when I first got started, the plan was to buy, you know, do five deals that year. And those might've been flips, rentals, whatever they were, it was just do five deals. And then, you know, here we are two years later, 60 properties later, like I didn't know that 60 properties in two years was something that I could do, right? So for me to say, to put a cap on what I think I'm gonna be able to do in the next two years based on something I don't know is crazy. Like, I don't, I don't know where I'm gonna be in two years, but I, wanna, I, I know the plan is to keep trying to grow. 
yeah. and to keep trying to scale. And if that means, you know, we stay on the, on the, you know, at the rate we've been going, that's great. And if it means we've figured out some way to grow even faster, then we'll do that. Or if it means we need to slow down, we'll do that. Like I, no clue. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. And that's a perfect insight to the situation because in the beginning of this conversation, you said, you know, you didn't have any money, you knew you needed to get more and you didn't know how to get to the next step, but you just started taking action. Right. But there was that time in between where you're like, you didn't really know what was going on and you're just kind of figuring out as you go. So now you're at like, let's say step seven out of 10, out of 10, you don't really know how to get to number eight or what number eight is going to be but you're still figuring it out. So you figure out all the other things. So there's always more things in the future that you're not going to know how to do, but you just need to keep pushing forward and like, okay, well I'll figure it out next. I'll figure it out next. And there's always learning to be done. What I do know is that there's so many levels to real estate investing, right? Like, and you know, that's not something I knew going in. Like when I first got started, I wanted to buy one rental property. And now I'm just a regular guy who's been able to scale a business to the point where you have 60. There's people out here with thousands of units, right? There's so many other levels, like in ways to get there. Yeah. I don't know what those are yet. Maybe I'll figure it out and I'll be there one day. And maybe I won't like it. I just, it's real estate's so powerful and so much fun. I just want to keep learning as much as I can. That's cool. Yeah. Isn't it funny that once you get into the game, you, you know, before you're in the game, you think, Oh, once I get to this level, man, I got it made. And then you get there and then all of a sudden you start meeting all these other people and you're like, damn, I got to get to there. And then you get to there and you're like, man, I got to get to there. Like it never, you know, here in my small town, you know, I always thought, you know, once I get to this many units or whatever, and then I got into this whole podcasting thing and more mastermind groups and all this stuff. Yeah. And I'm like meeting these people like you that yeah. in two and a half years, you got to 60 units. I'm like, dude, I never even knew this existed. You know, right. it's, <laughs> it's just amazing. Oh, I was having a conversation with another investor recently uh, who is one of these people who is doing these huge building apartment buildings and syndicating these large deals. Right. And like, you know, you know, getting to 60 units has been great, right? But to kind of hear him talk about that, like to hear him say like, hey, you need to look into what we're doing because if you can see this process of how we're doing, you won't be wasting time with the things you're doing anymore. And to, and to, like, yeah. to hear somebody refer to like what I've been doing as like, wasting time on his level <laughs> yeah. like that's crazy like it, it's not offensive to me i'm like yeah how do i get to that le like how do i get to where i can look back when i was you know 60 units in thinking man that was nothing right yeah it's, it's such a cool business yeah no for sure it just drives from the point that you need to broaden your uh group of people your sphere right. that you're in Absolutely. you know if you're always with the people that don't do anything then you yeah. do a little bit's going to sound amazing but if you right. get down to the next group that you're the lowest on the totem pole uh, it, yeah. then you're going to continue to move up so um Absolutely. i feel you i'm um there's so many um similarities to what you're saying to everything i've experienced myself so it's pretty cool so um what is your favorite resource for learning about you know we're always learning about new things in real estate how do you like to learn the best is it books or podcasts or seminars or mentors what is henry's go-to uh, source the best for me has been um, uh, podcasts and audiobooks, just because I'm in the truck so much um, for my commutes that, um, uh, you know, I'm just one of those people that audiobooks is, is like, I tend to retain, uh, you know, a lot of it that way. Some people can't do audiobooks. Um, uh, so, pro tip your local library has usually free audiobooks if you go sign up for a library card um they've usually got this like huge library of books that you can just do audiobooks for so you don't have to pay for a service it takes you you know you got to actually go down to the library to sign up for the library card but other than that then you get they have these apps you can download audiobooks so you get some free audiobooks that way um oh, cool um and then um the yeah, obviously um bigger pockets um but I listened to tons of podcasts, man. When I first got started, I uh, listened to a lot of uh, Danny Johnson's podcast, Flipping Junkie. Um, uh, he had some some really cool guests and kind of has a, uh, I think his shows are tend to be a little longer than the Bigger Pockets one. So you kind of get in a little more depth mm -hmm. um, with some of the guests. 
Um, so that one was super helpful. Um, uh, I would say the best investment I made last year was going to the bigger pockets conference. And, um, so I would tell people, man, if you can get to a conference, a real estate investment conference, it doesn't have to be the bigger pockets one, right? What I got out of that conference was the, the relationships. I now have a mentor circle of people that I met there and we get jump on a, a video call once a week. And it's just all about accountability. We set goals every week and then we check in the next week on where we were and then set new goals. And it's really been helpful. I think we've all made more progress than we thought we would because we knew we have these three other guys who are going to be asking us questions about, you know, what we said we were going to do. And had I not gone to that conference, I wouldn't have met those people. Um, then I met a ton of other people. Like the content at the conference, I tell people don't focus so much on what they're talking about, like the speakers, right? It's real estate investing. Like if you want to learn it, you can get on YouTube and learn all this stuff for free. Like it's not about what they're going to teach you when you get there. It's about the networking and the relationships you meet. And like, I would tell people to figure out what it is that you need for your business before you get there, write it down. And then when you get there, find people who do the thing that you need. Like if you need private money, go there and ask everybody if they're private money lenders, right? And set up conversations with them, buy them a drink, right? If you need deals, go there and find people who specifically focus on finding deals. Like just be strategic about who you want to go meet and talk to everybody you can. Yeah, that's great advice. I like that. I haven't been to any um, uh, conferences yet. And so I just, I've been so it's, busy, it's hard, but I need to. It's hard to bite that bullet because the initial ticket is usually expensive. Yeah. But man, the value I got, like, I have no problem paying it for another conference. Like, like I said, if you just focus on the things that you want, there's somebody there that's either good at what you want to get good at or has the thing that you want and maybe needs the thing that you already have. Yeah. That's awesome. Good. Good to know. Okay. What about a favorite app or piece of technology that you use? Man, Cozy saves my life right now. Um, Cozy.co. Um, yeah, man. All my pro I, I require all my tenants to pay rent through there. I don't pick up checks. I don't, I don't, I don't collect any rent. They all got to pay in there. It's got a work order system. So if something breaks, I can just put it in there. And then that sends me an email and then I forward that email to my handyman. I don't do any of the work. Not that, I mean, I don't want to, but even if I could, yeah, I wouldn't, but I literally can't. So that's <laughs> awesome. Like, I'm not that guy. So somebody else needs to do it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Right on. So what about a mindset tip to kind of get you um, oh, somebody boy. that's in a rut or something like, you I, know, I could, I could talk about this all day, man. Mindset, yeah. is, mindset is what it's all about. Um, yeah, I think at some point, like, don't get me wrong. Like, I think education is huge. Like there, are, you know, I don't think you should just wake up one day, decide you want to be a real estate investor. And then the next day go try to buy a deal. Right. Like, I don't think that's a great course of action. I think you'll learn something. I think you're going to pay for an education either way. Right. Whether you do a bad deal or whether you go pay somebody to educate you. Right. So, mm -hmm. I look at education and from real estate perspective, like there's three ways, right? You can pay for it, right? So you can pay a guru or you can do a bad deal and you're going to pay for lessons learned that way. Or you can get paid to get an education, right? Which is do enough research, take some action, do a decent deal that pays you some money. And then you've got paid to learn how to do this. Right. And I think that, you can do that by, like I said, doing a little bit of research, surrounding yourself with people who are successful and uh, asking a lot of questions of them and trying to provide value to them at the same time. And I think if you do that right, then you can get paid to do it. But uh, I mean, this business is about taking action and it's about figuring out problems. I think that um, if you're the kind of person that is going to run into a brick wall or um, you know, see a problem and get discouraged, like it's not for you, right? This is, you're going to hit bumps in the road 
constantly. Like people always ask me, you're a landlord. What, what happens when something breaks? I'm like, I fix it. <laughs> like, <laughs> like it's not, a, it's not a big, like I'm not concerned about when and if something breaks. Like I budget for that when I buy the deal, like things are going to break. It's going to be a headache. Right. But if you have the mindset that like every time something goes wrong, it's going to bum you out, then you're never going to be successful. You just have to know that like, you're going to be persistent and you're going to be successful. And um, I think the rest will always follow, man. You know, there's always going to be headaches. You know, I've gotten calls from projects where things seem like they should be a catastrophe, but I mean, they're not. <laughs> yeah. It's nothing a little bit of money can't fix. And uh, you know, that just means you don't make as much money on the backside, but that's okay. Yeah. Doing cool. Video. Cool, man. I appreciate that. Um, so where can people find out more about you and what you're doing? Sure. Uh, Instagram, uh, best way to reach me. So you can reach me at, uh, at independence realty group on Instagram. Uh, you can email me J J W A S H four five at Gmail or Henry at independence realty group NWA, uh, dot com. So cool. Best ways to reach me. All right. Well, Henry, I, th- I appreciate you being here, man. That was a ton of good info. I have so many more questions, but yeah. you know, we're an hour and 10 minutes in and you know, you probably got, you know, 20 more rentals to go by today. So yeah. <laughs> we'll have to schedule another call, Let's do it. Let's do but, it. uh, I appreciate everything you did here, man. And, uh, you have a great afternoon. All right. You do the same. Thanks.